Tonight, we're going to be walking through Psalm 2. Last week, we began a series of walking through the Psalms. Last week was Psalm 1. Tonight is Psalm 2. And as we get started tonight, I want you to imagine going on a vacation. Probably not much of a stretch for most of us. A lot of us have already done our vacationing. Driving somewhere, going across the country, flying somewhere, going on a cruise ship. Let's imagine the cruise ship. You've already made your plans. You've booked your tickets. You've been planning this for a while. You're excited about the destination. The food, being on the deck while cruising the sea. You show up at the dock, getting ready to embark. And while you're waiting in the embarkation line, God gives you a glimpse of the future. He lets you see five days into the future. And the glimpse into the future that he shows you is of a ship hitting an iceberg and sinking. The glimpse of the future he shows you has 1,496 people tragically dying in the ice-cold waters of the North Atlantic. It's Wednesday, April 10th, 1912, and you're about to board the RMS Titanic. Having this glimpse of the future and knowing what was going to take place, do you think that would affect your plans? Do you think you would change your plans? Or would you simply throw caution to the wind, ignore the glimpse, and board the ship anyway? Tonight we're going to look at Psalm 2. And tonight God is going to give us a glimpse of the future. More specifically, he's going to give us a glimpse of the end. But before we get started, we need to cover a little bit of background information related to this psalm. The first piece of information we're going to cover is the author. While there's no author specifically given in this psalm itself, we know with confidence that King David wrote this psalm. Go ahead and open your Bibles. Turn over to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, we'll be looking at verse 25. Acts chapter 4, verse 25 says, Who, by the Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and peop the peoples devise vain things? And then he goes on to finish uh, quoting, the, he quotes the, the first two verses of Psalm 2. And so the book of Acts attributes this psalm to King David, and therefore we can confidently ascribe to King David the authorship of this psalm. The next thing as a piece of background information that'll be helpful for us tonight is looking at the structure. Psalm 2 is poetry. It has 12 verses, and they're broken up into four stanzas. Each stanza has three verses each. And each one of these stanzas provides a new scene that is being described, and that will be very clear as we work through the outline. The next thing that I think we need to talk about tonight as far as background information is prophecy. This psalm is prophetic, and it's looking to the future. It's specifically looking at the end of time. This psalm is pointing us to kingdom realities. It's pointing us to the time when Jesus Christ returns and reigns on the earth. And since David first penned this psalm, there have been many events in the world, in world history, that have been in the trajectory of the prophecy described in this psalm, specifically verse 2. So go ahead, if you're not already there, make sure you go back to Acts chapter 4. Um, I want to read Acts chapter 4, verses 24 through 28. Starting in verse 24. When they, this is the early church, heard this, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said, O oh, Master, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against the, his Christ. 
For truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. The Jews of Jesus's day recognized this Psalm as speaking about the Messiah. So when the early church witnessed these events, their minds immediately ran to this Psalm. They saw Herod and Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, gathered together against Jesus. They naturally and rightly saw these events in line with their trajectory described here in Psalm 2. However, the events described in Psalm 2 have not yet occurred in their fullest expression. They have not yet been ultimately fulfilled. The prophets, Jesus himself, and all the apostles affirm that the nations will continue to rise up against God and against his Messiah until it's ultimately fulfilled. And that will be when Jesus Christ returns to reign in his kingdom here on the earth. Here on the earth, the world has not stopped raging because Christ is not yet reigning. That's the lens that we're going to use to look at this psalm tonight. We're going to look at the prophetic picture that it paints when these things are ultimately realized. So the purpose of this, I've titled this psalm, A Glimpse of the End. This psalm doesn't say everything about the end. It doesn't say everything that's coming, but it provides a glimpse. And if you were here for the service this morning, you got to hear from Zechariah chapter 12 as Scott preached that. That provided a lot more detail than what this is going to do in some of those things. And that was all just God's providence that those two things, this and that happened on the same day. We did not plan that. And so what is this psalm all about? God is providing a glimpse of the end so that Christ would be sought now. I'll say that again. God is providing a glimpse of the end so that Christ would be sought now. Tonight, we're going to see this glimpse of the end unfold in four dramatic scenes. Typically, I would read through all of the verses as we get started, but as these scenes unfold, the drama builds and the anticipation builds, so we're going to just let that have its effect as we work through that here tonight. So number one is the world's rebellion. This is the first scene, and the glimpse that we get of the end is hear the world's rebellion. Number one, let's go ahead and let's read through verses one through three. Why do the nations rage and the peoples meditate on a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. The first part of this scene shows us a shocking situation. Let's look again at verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples meditate on a vain thing? The opening scene here paints a shocking picture of worldwide rebellion. And the psalmist introduces us to this rebellious scene by asking the question, why? The nations and peoples here being used are a poetic synonym. And the idea here is that they represent all peoples. The people of the world are violently angry and are meditating on how to overthrow their king. They're plotting rebellion against God. But this can't be successful. The creature trying to overthrow the creator, that's utter foolishness. Rebellion against God is a vain thing. It's folly. It has no benefit. It comes to no advantage. So the psalmist asks, why? Why are you doing this? Why would you even bother? It's completely irrational. It doesn't make any sense. The next part of this scene describes the treasonous actions of these people. Let's look at verse 2. The kings of the earth take their stand And the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, saying. 
The kings of the earth and the rulers are again poetic synonyms representing the leaders of the world. These leaders, and by extension those that they lead, take their stand. They get into a defiant posture, one for the purpose of resisting. This is the position one gets into when they're expecting a fight. These leaders are also said to be counseling together or conspiring or planning rebellion. These leaders perform these treasonous actions together. They're all united into one group with a common purpose. They have this common purpose, and that is hostility against Yahweh and against his anointed. They're united against two people, two persons. One is Yahweh. And your Bible may show capital L, capital O, R, D, all in caps. That is the Hebrew name Yahweh. That is the personal name of God, the covenant-keeping God of Israel. And the other person they're united against is Yahweh's anointed. Anointed is the English word, but the Hebrew word here is Messiah. Now, when you hear the word Messiah, we usually run and immediately think, put an equal sign with Jesus. However, that would often be a mistake to do that in most places in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, anointed was used to describe a number of people. 39 times it's used almost exclusively as a synonym for a king. But not just any king, not every king was called his anointed. The implication is that this special anointed one is the choice, has the cho is the choice and has the approval of God. It emphasizes a special relationship between God and the anointed. It was used of Saul. It was used of David many times. And it was even used of the Persian king Cyrus. But here... Yahweh's anointed, Yahweh's special king is the Messiah. This psalm as a whole is not describing any earthly king, but it's describing God's special king. And it's making reference to Jesus, the Christ. And just as a quick side note, Christ in the New Testament is not Jesus' last name. It is his title. It means anointed one or Messiah. So when we say Jesus the Christ, we mean Jesus the Messiah. And for Jews, before Jesus' first coming, they had an anticipation of a coming king, a great deliverer, one from the line of David, the Messiah. And the name Messiah had come into use as the designation for this king, primarily because of this psalm, primarily because of verse 2. And where it's also found in Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 and 26. And so the leaders of the world and those they're leading are united against Yahweh and against his Messiah. These treasonous actions lead to a rebellious declaration. Let's look at verse 3. Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Here, the rebels speak, and they verbalize and declare their rebellious intentions. They acknowledge God's rule and reign, and they recognize his authority. They understand what God sees as right and wrong, but they see his will, his laws, and his expectations as fetters or chains, which keep one imprisoned, and they want to tear them off and break free from them. They want to violently throw these restraints away. They do not recognize God as good and his ways as being good. They want to be in charge. They want to rule. They want to be the authority for what's right and what's wrong. These rebels are asserting their independence, openly defying and rebelling against Yahweh and his Messiah. For these rebels to actually rebel in this way, they obviously recognize and explicitly acknowledge Yahweh and his Messiah as the rightful ones to be ruling. They also recognize and explicitly acknowledge his laws and what he expects. It's one thing to claim to be an atheist and want to live under your own authority and rule. It's quite another 
to explicitly know that you're picking a fight with God. The absolute corruption of man's heart such that they would think it's rational to explicitly and intentionally try to overthrow God and his Messiah. Having seen the world's rebellion here in the first scene, we now move on to the next scene. And the glimpse of the end that we're going to see here is number two, the Lord's indignation. The Lord's indignation. Let's read verses four through six. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord mocks them. Then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his fury saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. We have a striking scene change. In scene one, we're on the earth with all the commotion where the world has assembled and taken their stand in high-handed rebellion, declaring their independence. And in dramatic fashion, we're brought to the tranquility of heaven. The abode that's infinitely high above the earth. There's no one standing, but there is one sitting. And the one sitting is not simply sitting, but he is enthroned in the heavens. And what's the response to what's going down on the earth? What's the response to all of this chaos and commotion that's going down on earth, where the world is rebelling against Yahweh, where the world has taken its stand? Laughter. The one enthroned in the heavens laughs. Verse 4 says, The Lord mocks them. You may notice the word Lord here is not all caps. That's because this is a different word. The word here is the Hebrew word Adonai. This is the divine title denoting the one that exercises all control and all authority over all the universe. He simply is master of the universe. And here, the Lord is laughing and mocking the earth dwellers. The laughing and mocking again are poetic synonyms conveying the idea of a contemptuous ridicule and derision. Actually making the sounds like laughing and scoffing that would ridicule and disparage another. This mocking is the strongest possible expression of contempt. The pure absurdity of the situation where the tiny, insignificant earth dwellers are rising up against the infinitely powerful and mighty master of the universe. Their rebellion is not just odious. It is absurd and fully deserving of mocking contempt. So how will the Lord react to all of this? Verse 5 says, Then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his fury. Verse 5 says he reacts by doing two things. He speaks and he terrifies. He speaks as in verbal communication. Verse 4, he was laughing and mocking He was making mocking and scoffing sounds, and now he speaks. He speaks to the earth dwellers. He also terrifies. It's not just saying that God is terrifying, but in this case, he actually brings about the effects that the rebels themselves are terrified. Terror has arrived, and panic ensues. The Lord's reaction here in verse 5 is fueled by his indignation. The intense anger that's aroused by the rejection and rebellion to his sovereign rule. He will tolerate no opposition or competition. There is simply none like him. So he speaks in anger. He terrifies in fury. This anger and fury are both communicating in intense anger, a furious anger or wrath. They both imply a physical reaction 
when the anger is so intense as to cause the face to become flush with blood. I want you to imagine the picture of someone so angry that they grit their teeth, that they clench their fist, that their eyebrows, everything in their face is showing and displaying this anger such that their face is red with blood. That's the picture we have here. God is so intensely angry that there's a physical reaction such that the face becomes flush with blood. That God would be that angry in and of itself is horrifying. To be the object of that anger would be utterly terrifying. And verse 5 tells us that the earth dwellers from this first scene are the objects of his indignation. I want you to see an example of the terror of the Lord as it's, as it's inflicted upon the earth dwellers in the last days and their response to it. So go ahead and turn over to Revelation chapter 6, verses, starting in verse 15. Revelation 6, verse 15. Starting in verse 15. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? The great day of his wrath has come and the earth dwellers respond in terror. In sheer panic, they are desperately trying to get away from the presence of God Almighty and his Messiah. His king, his lamb. So what does the Lord actually say that's so terrifying? We find that in chapter, or in verse 6, so back over to Psalm 2. In verse 6, it says, Yahweh says, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Here the Lord replies to the rebellious earth dwellers. You spoke, rejecting me and my Messiah, asserting your independence. You wanted to rule the earth. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. The word here for installed is conveying the idea of installing a leader into an office or a position to set one in place. The one being installed to rule the earth is not just a king or even the king. It is my king, says the Lord. And his king is being installed to rule on the earth from a particular location upon Zion my holy mountain. Zion sometimes refers to Jerusalem, but when coupled with Mount, as in Mount Zion, it's referring specifically to the Temple Mount, that very specific piece of real estate that is in Jerusalem. And history makes no mention of any king being anointed on Mount Zion or ruling from there. But scripture is pretty clear about one reigning on Mount Zion in the future. Go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah chapter 24, starting in verse 17. <clears throat> Isaiah 24, starting in verse 17. Panic and pit and pitfall are upon you, O inhabitant of the earth. Then it will be that he who flees the sound of panic will fall into the pit. And he who climbs out of the pit will be caught in the pitfall. For the windows above are opened and the foundations of the earth quake. The earth is broken asunder. The earth is split through. The earth is shaken violently. The earth reels to and fro like a drunkard and it totters like a shack. For its transgression is heavy upon it and it will fall never to rise again. So it will be in that day that Yahweh will punish the host 
of heights on high and the kings of the earth on earth. They will be gathered together like prisoners in the pit and will be confined in prison. And after many days, they will be punished. The moon will be humiliated and the sun ashamed. And specifically now here in verse 23, for Yahweh of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and his glory will be before his elders. So what's so terrifying to these earth dwellers about the Lord's reply? It's terrifying because the king that's coming to reign and rule on the earth is God himself. Yahweh of hosts, this Messiah, this coming king is God and he is coming with great indignation. Having seen the Lord's indignation here in the second scene, we now move on to the next scene. And the glimpse of the end that we see here is number three, the Messiah's reign. The Messiah's reign. Let's read verses seven through nine. I will surely tell of the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like a potter's vessel. This new scene has a new speaker. The speaker here is the anointed one, the Messiah, the Lord's king that will rule and reign from Mount Zion. And he will tell or to declare the decree of Yahweh. This decree would have been read by Yahweh as a part of the coronation of the Messiah to mark the moment when the new sovereign formally steps in and takes his office and his titles. This decree would have included clearly communicated prescription of what the Messiah was to do in his new office. And so the Messiah here recounts historically the decree of Yahweh that was said to him at his enthronement. And the first thing that was decreed is the Messiah's identity. In the middle of verse seven, it says, you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. The Lord Yahweh decrees that this king, his Messiah is his son. This tightens up the relationship of Yahweh to his king. This is not just appointing someone and picking a king, but it's his king. It's his son. This is the only Old Testament reference to the father-son relationship within the Trinity. The son, as was common under a hereditary monarchy, would receive all of the authority and privileges expressed by this relationship. All submission that was due to his father is now due him by legal right. And today, as in the day of his coronation as king, he was begotten of the father. He was not begotten, or he was begotten, he was not created. This is simply Yahweh declaring, I'm your father. Jesus the Messiah is decreed to be the son of God. The next part of this decree tells us about the Messiah's kingdom. Let's look at verse 8. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. The Father decrees that the Son shall but ask, and he will receive complete universal dominion over the whole world. The Father is the creator and possessor of the world. It would only be natural and expected that his heir would inherit this vast domain. The son shall ask, and the ends of the earth shall become his possession. The ends of the earth was a common Old Testament, Old Testament expression for the whole earth. It shall become his possession. He now has legal right to rule and reign over all of it. Just by way of reminder, these decrees are what the son has been recounting historically that the father decreed at his coronation. And the father said, ask of me. Well, the son asked and the son received it. 
And that this is implied from the first scene where the world is rebelling against Yahweh and rebelling against his anointed. They recognize the Messiah and the rightful sovereign that they, and they're rejecting him. While the Messiah's throne is on Mount Zion, the extents of his kingdom cover the entirety of the earth. This leads to the next decree, and this is the Messiah's rule. The Messiah's rule. Verse 9 says, You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like a potter's vessel. Break and shatter are synonymous and convey the idea of destruction for the object. And here, the objects of both of these verbs are the rebellious subjects within the kingdom, within Christ's kingdom, from verses 1 through 3. In the first part of this verse, it says that you shall break or destroy them with a rod of iron. The word here for rod can be used in a shepherding context for correction, punishment, or a weapon. It can also be used to describe a scepter, which was a symbol of rulership. I think both of these ideas can be merged here as the Messiah exercises his rule. As he exercises his rule by punishing the wicked. This phrase, rod of iron, is alluded to or explicitly, or explicitly quoted in multiple places. And I think it's helpful for us to turn back over to the book of Revelation. So go ahead and do that. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. Revelation 19, 15. And this is speaking when, of Christ's return to the earth. And from his mouth, this is Jesus, from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the wrath of... Try, he treads the winepress of the wrath of the rage of God the Almighty. This is Christ the King of kings, the Lord of lords, gloriously returning to earth to strike down all his enemies and to punish all the wicked. This verse is simply saturated with the judgment of Christ's enemies. The other part of our verse, going back over to verse 9 in Psalm 2, you shall shatter or destroy them like a potter's vessel. A potter's vessel was simply some kind of pottery that's what's envisioned here, and pottery is fragile. And when it's shattered intentionally, it can be broken into a thousand pieces. It is completely destroyed. The point here is it has been decreed by the Father that the Son shall destroy all of his enemies. All of them. I want us to go to Luke chapter 19. This is very helpful for us understanding what's going on here. Or to put a picture to this, what Jesus actually says here in Luke chapter 19, looking at verse, starting in verse 11. Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 11. Now, while they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And they thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. They had this expectation that this king was going to be arriving and that he was going to be setting up his kingdom right now. That was their expectation. And so Jesus is going to tell them a parable. He's going to explain some more things here in verse 12. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 minas. And he said to them, engage in business until I come back. Verse 14, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. And it happened that when he returned, after receiving the kingdom, he ordered the slaves to come, and to whom he had given the money, and he called them so that he might know how much they had made in business. Drop down to verse 27. But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Bring them here and slay them in my presence. The Messiah's rule is absolute. 
No enemy will stand. None of those rebels will survive. They will all be destroyed. His judgment on the rebellious will be overpowering, complete, terrifying, and without mercy. This is not the suffering servant who came, who is coming to save. This is the king who is coming to punish the wicked. Having seen the Messiah's reign in the third scene, we now move on to the next scene. And in this next scene, we're given an exhortation. Number four, the psalmist's exhortation. Let's read verses 10 through 12. So now, O kings, show insight. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. We have another dramatic scene change. We have a change in time and we have a change in tone. The first three scenes were looking to the future, but now the psalmist is speaking to his, to his readers in current time. In verse 10, he addresses kings and judges, the great of the earth, the ones that currently lead and rule the earth. And while he's addressing the leader specifically, it has application to mankind generally. There's also a change in tone. While the first three scenes declare the sobering events that are going to happen in the future, this scene provides an exhortation to not be an enemy of the kingdom, but to be a citizen of it. We're going to walk through this exhortation with six commands. The psalmist provides five commands. I added a sixth by turning an indicative into an imperative. That'll make sense when we get there. The first command is found in the beginning of verse 10. Be wise. Be wise. The psalmist says, show insight. Your translation may say, show discernment, or simply say, be wise. This command means to get wisdom, gain understanding. Learn from these first nine verses and gain understanding. Do not be simple. Do not be naive. Do not be ignorant. The next command is found in the second half of verse 10, and it's be warned. Be warned. The psalmist says, take warning. This means receive information about a future danger or the consequences of certain actions. The first nine verses detail significant dangers associated with rebellion. Receive this information and don't go there. Take action as a result of understanding the danger, the dangers and the consequences. The next command is to be enslaved. This is verse 11, the first half. The psalmist says, serve Yahweh with fear. The word here for serve can mean be a slave. It can also mean worship. I think this command actually has a sense of both. In contrast to the enemies of the kingdom found in verse 3, the ones that want to tear off and throw away their fetters and their chains, God says, be enslaved. Be enslaved to Yahweh with fear. Turn from your own sinful will and desires and be enslaved to his. Worship him by completely giving over your entire life and will to him, such that you are no longer concerned about your will, but his. The next command is to be joyful, found in the second half of verse 11. The psalmist says, rejoice with trembling. Rejoice, rejoice with trembling for those that are citizens of the kingdom. They will have a joy that is inexpressible. They won't be able to keep it in. They will break out in singing or shouts or other external manifestations. But this rejoicing will be with trembling. As God's wrath is mercilessly poured out on the enemies of the kingdom. The next command is to be submissive. First half of 
Verse 12, kiss the son lest he become angry and you perish in the way for his wrath may soon be kindled. To kiss the son here means to pay homage. It was a way to profess loyalty and allegiance to a sovereign. It would have been the same as to submit to him, to yield our will to his and to obey his laws. Notice there is a warning attached to this command. We're to be submissive, lest the son become angry. And as a result of his anger, you perish. And as Smed shared last week from Psalm 1, that word for perish is the same word that's used here. I think this word is talking about more than simply mortal death. Given the one who is angry and doing the judging, I think this perishing is talking about eternal punishment. Also note in this part of the verse, the temporal accelerator, the motivation to not wait. Don't put it off until tomorrow. He says, for his wrath may soon be kindled. The picture here is placing fire to a combustible material. This is actually trying to catch something on fire. And as soon as you it doesn't take long from when you put something there to when it actually starts blazing. And the sun's wrath is ready to ignite at any moment. I want you to go ahead and turn over to Luke chapter 12, verse 49. Luke chapter 12, verse 49. Jesus says... I have come to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish it was already kindled. I have come to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish it was already kindled. This is timely submission. This is to be submissive to the sun and don't wait. Do not wait until tomorrow. This needs to be timely. In our, in our last command, found in the last half of verse 12, I said it's to be blessed. The psalmist says, how blessed are all those who take refuge in him? How blessed are all those who take refuge in him? Blessed simply means happy. Who are the ones, who are the ones that are blessed? It's all those who take refuge in him, who take refuge in the Son. All those who put their trust in the Son for the safety of their souls are blessed. So the implication here is be blessed. Put your trust in the Son and be blessed. Living on this side of the cross, that means trusting in Christ, trusting in Jesus, the Son of God, and what he accomplished at the cross to satisfy the wrath of God for sins. It means repenting and turning from your sin and turning to Jesus. There's also another implication here. Those that don't take refuge in the sun will not be blessed, but they will experience the full wrath of the coming king. Derek Kidner says this, there is no refuge from him, only in him. The glimpse of the end that God has graciously provided puts a stake in the ground. There are only two choices. Are you an enemy of the kingdom or are you a citizen of the kingdom? The obvious implication for those who do not know Christ that do not want to submit to his will is to repent, turn from your sin, turn to this Messiah Turn to Jesus, the Son of God. An obvious implication for those of us who know Jesus is to evangelize. Evangelize the lost in the hopes that they would seek Jesus, that they would turn to him and he would be their refuge, that they would find refuge in him. Another implication from all of this can be related to anxiety. We look around this world, 
And it seems that things are out of control. People rebelling and calling what God has said wicked good and what God has said is good, wicked. No matter how chaotic this world may seem, he has it all under control. He will carry out his plan. God is in control and his Christ will return. And his Christ will make all things right. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. It's already been written. It's future history. And we just got to look through it. We've been given a glimpse and we know how it all ends. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us this glimpse, this glimpse of the end so that we can see how all of these things come together. Father, how you are glorious, how you have commissioned your son, your king, your Messiah to reign and rule here on earth, to make all things right. And just your kindness and graciousness to give us this glimpse such that there's an opportunity, an invitation to repent, to turn to him, to live for you. I pray as we respond to these weighty things that we would take these things to heart, that it would bear fruit in our lives. For those that do not yet know you, I pray, Lord, you would change their hearts, that they would respond by repenting and turning to you. And for those of us who do know you, Lord, that we would worship you Worship your majesty. Worship what you have coming. Lord, that we would just glorify you as long as we are on this earth. And it's always in your great name we pray. Amen.